All the homework questions are based upon this founding principle, that the change in kinetic energy plus the change in gravitational potential energy will equal zero joules. This is also known as an isolated system. In other words, whatever energy you may gain kinetically is because you lost some gravitationally. Or whatever energy you've gained gravitationally is because you've lost the energy kinetically. So this formula over here can be expanded out and it looks something a bit like this. 1 half mvf squared uh, minus 1 half mvi squared as change means that you're doing a difference in your final subtract your initial values. And then we'll rinse and repeat for eg. mg delta hf minus mg delta hi and that's equal to zero joules. If you take uh, I guess the final values and bring them over you'll get negative one half mvi squared minus mg delta hi is equal to negative one half mvf squared minus one half m well one half, sorry minus mg delta hf and I'm only doing this way just so that you can see that they're all minus terms and then they can all just be multiplied by negative one to become positive and you'll get this formula over here which is effectively ETI is equal to ETF. All right, so the total energy you have at the beginning, which is your kinetic and potential, is equal to the total energy you have at the end. All right, so all these questions here will start off with a formula that looks like this. But wait, before I move on, we'll notice that every single one of these terms has the variable M. And if they all have the variable M, then we can simplify it down into this formula here. All right, so we'll use our starting point as this to answer the next three questions. So question number eight, you have a 10 kilogram mass, which I guess it doesn't matter, but we'll still start state in our givens. Mass is equal to 10.0 kilograms. Was thrown off an initial height of 100 meters at a VI of 20 meters per second. What is the speed of the rock quarter of the way down? In other words, your delta HF is equal to delta HI minus a quarter of delta HI. Right, so it's whatever your initial height is, subtract of a quarter of it because you've fallen that, that far down. In other words, you're going to be three quarters of delta HI down. And three quarters of, of 100 meters equals 75 meters. So that's your delta HF. And with uh, these givens here, we are just looking for how fast are you moving. And one of the neat things about using this energy, this formula over here, is that direction doesn't matter. In fact, this may seem strange. Let's say that I'm right over here and I'm tossing a ball. Now, if I toss the ball at 10 meters per second, it doesn't matter if I throw it up like this at a diagonal projectile, straight forward, there, or even straight down. All of these cases over here, when they eventually hit the ground, wherever that may be, they all hit the ground at the same exact speed. And this has to do with the conservation of energy. At this height over here, I have EK due to the 10 meters per second. I also have EG as I have an initial height. And at the end, they all share the same exact final height. In other words, they all share the same exact EKF. All right. Okay. So with that in mind, we can continue with this problem over here. All right, so since we're solving for uh, VF over here, we'll just quickly rearrange for it. Uh, so we have one half, oh, before we move on, uh, we see, oh, no, well, I'll just rearrange it. Um, one thing I like to do actually is I like to just double everything just to get rid of the one half. So I have VI squared plus two G delta HI is equal to VF squared plus two G delta HF, as it's a lot cleaner and faster to solve for my VF. So my VF is equal to VI squared plus two G delta HI minus two G delta HF. And optionally, if you really want to, you could factor out uh, the two G. So you have your HI minus HF. In fact, some textbooks just simply call it HI and HF because the delta just makes it even more confusing. Uh, at the end, please don't be confused with that. The delta is just to remind you that you're starting from some known reference point. All right, so your HI is referenced 
to whatever this height is over here. So if it's a reference at zero meters, that's your delta HI, and then this is your delta HF. In fact, even if we change our reference point, you'll see that the outcome of the difference between the two are still exactly the same. All right, now we can sub all the values in and crunch through this. So we have the root of 20 meters per second quantity squared plus two times 9.81 meters per second squared. And if you're wondering why in the world is this positive over here as opposed to negative, it has to do with the fact that when you lift an object, that's the applied force, and then the force of gravity is opposite of it, all right? But you'll find out that as you lift it, uh, your, your FAP is equal to mg, which is why it remains a positive value. All right, so 2g of the initial height of 100 meters minus 25 meters. Crunch that through, and you should get an answer of 29.8 meters per second. All right, now if you want to solve this using kinematics, you totally could, and as I said, the direction doesn't really matter. All right, and I'll let you try that out as a personal exercise. All right, so you imagine it's a projectile, and heck, you can even start doing it from this way and try from vertically. Okay, and you'll see that the outcome will work out to the same number. Now, the angle will be different, but the magnitude will be identical. Um, yeah, that's to prove the next point. Okay, would the final speed change? Nope, not at all, and it has to do with the conservation of energy. C O E, conservation of energy. Okay, moving on to question number nine. And I know that Jet Scream doesn't really exist anymore, but it's been replaced with effectively Lumberjack, if you've ever been on that ride at Canada's Wonderland. All right, the principle is exactly the same. You start off at the bottom of the ride, and usually there's a counterweight at the top to allow the ride to rotate. Now at first it's just gonna rotate a little bit as it's trying to gain its uh, momentum, and eventually it's gonna make it to the top. And once it makes it to the top, it's going to pause for a brief moment so that uh, you can enjoy the ride more. And since it pauses here, we know that our VF is equal to zero meters. If this ride has a height of 30 meters, so your delta HF is equal to 30 meters, down here, your delta HI is equal to zero meters, then you can search for what your VI needs to be. Once again, we're going to be using this equation from up here. And I'm just going to shift things over to the left, just so that we can line up our equal signs. Okay, so in your givens, you have a VF is equal to zero meters, you have a delta HF of 30 meters, you have a delta HI of zero meters, and you're trying to look for what is the minimum speed required so that it can make it to the top and pause for a brief moment. Okay, let's go and solve that now. Okay, so at this point over here, as I said, it might be easier just to double everything. So we're left with VI squared plus G delta HI times two is equal to VF squared plus two G delta HF. Our VF goes to zero, so this term goes to zero. Uh, our HI goes to zero, so that term goes to zero. So our VI squared is simply equal to 2G delta HF. So whether we have riders on it or not, the outcome will be the same, at least for speed. Not necessarily for uh, the energy required by the, you know, the wheels that actually accelerate the thing. Have you ever seen it? The, the wheels just simply spin it uh, back and forth, uh, just like Lucy's tugboat, if you've ever, played, if you've ever been on that ride as well. Um, so yeah, the energy requirement will be different, but the speed will be exactly the same with or without riders. Okay, so your VI is equal to the root of two. Planet does matter. That's why the uh, this variable still remains of G. And your delta H is equal to 30 meters. Crunch that through and you'll get a minimum speed of 24.3 meters per second necessary at the bottom of the ride, regardless if you're going to the right or to the left in order to just briefly stop at the top so that you can have a good time. All right, all right. Question number ten. Most roller coasters, um, when you have a loop to loop, for one thing, when you're at the top of the ride, your V is never equal to zero. Otherwise, you'll be stuck. All right, and you're gonna have a minimum speed because you're never gonna have a case where you'll notice that you'll be falling off your seats. All right, you have to move quickly enough so that you still make solid contact with the track. And in this case over here, uh, they had to be moving at 8.86 meters per second. 
uh, in the diagram it also mentions to you that over here you have a height of uh, 16 meters so our VF is equal to 8.86 meters per second and our height in the setup over here is 16 meters now we're starting from the top over here where you know it's it's kind of like uh, I forgot that ride the ride which hangs you know, on top uh, where you're initially at zero meters per second okay and that way you can quickly go down and enjoy the loop-de-loops all right so how high must that first hill be and that's what we're trying to look for delta HI back to this formula again we know that our VI goes to zero so we don't need to worry about that term and we're just simply isolating for HI so our HI is equal to one half VF squared plus G delta HF all over G uh, one thing to mention is that please don't assume that you can get rid of all the G's as this term over here has no G so you can't just simply divide that out uh, what this effectively tells you is that um, yeah the, the planet that you're doing this experiment on does matter because it's going to influence your final answer so we sub the values in one half 8.86 meters per second quantity squared plus 9.81 meters per second squared times a height of 16 meters divided by 9.81 meters per second squared if all goes well you'll get 20 meters an interesting thing about all these loop-de-loops is that the minimum height over here is always going to be relative to r that height is always going to be 5 over 2r and that will be proven to you in grade 12 physics If you're curious about what one, one ray track is, here it is in the video over here. All right, you can see that the truck uh, was going down the hill way too fast. Uh, this often, uh, these things are usually built in areas where it's very uh, hilly, like uh, out in the West Coast, uh, or even in Colorado where this video takes place. And you can see that the truck needed this off ramp over here so that it could slow down and eventually come to a rest. Now with most of these, cities, they're not frictionless because you know, if you do the math for this, 37 meters is, you know, quite a few stories tall. Uh, yeah, it's too absurd uh, for anything to really realistically be that tall. So they usually have, you know, crumbled dirt and whatnot, just to increase the coefficient of friction, right? But let's just say that this is one where there is no air resistance we need to worry about or any friction, all right? Uh, how fast was this truck traveling so that at a 14 degree incline uh, that it can travel almost 200 meters before coming to a, a stop? Okay, first off, we need to figure out what the height is. And if you take a look at this, this is a lovely right angle triangle where we have the hypotenuse and we have the angle. And this side over here is the opposite. So we're just simply trying to look for the opposite component. That's equal to the hypotenuse times the sine of theta. So you go through that number crunching and you will get your 37.26 meters. Keeping in mind that at the beginning, your initial height is at ground level so you're at zero meters and again your final velocity or final speed is at zero meters per second and that is your givens so your vi or sorry your vf is equal to zero your hf is equal to uh, 154 meters times the sine of 14 degrees which is equal to 37.26 meters HI of zero meters. So looking for your VI, back to that formula again, which is one half MVI squared plus MG delta HI is equal to one half MVF squared plus MG delta HF. By the way, if you want to start with this as your statement, I'm totally fine with that because that universally tells us that ETI is equal to ETF. All right, so we said the VF goes to zero that communicates to a reader that that term goes to zero, same as this term over here. And if you want to add joules, you can if you want to be uh, extra particular. Okay, what does this tell us? Well, the masses divide each other out. So VI is equal to two G delta HF rooted. So the root of two, depending on what planet you are on, it does matter. Uh, the height is 37.26 meters. All right. So in under these circumstances, you'll be needing to you'll be moving at 27 meters per second initially, 
And if you multiply that by 3.6, if you're curious, that works out to roughly 100 kilometers per hour. Again, more realistically, uh, there's going to be dirt, gravel. Sometimes they even use those water uh, pails, those big water uh, buckets to try to slow down the speed of the truck when it collides. And yeah, there's going to be a bit of damage to the truck. Um, and you also have to pay a towing fee once you're at the top. But that's certainly better than um, you know having lives lost. And you know that's something I really want to talk about. Something uh, that, that happened locally, not too far from where we live. If you take a look at this picture over here, this is the off-ramp at the end of 404. Um, if you're curious, let me just rewind back, since you can drive backwards on this. Originally, the 404 ended on steels when you're going northbound. All right, and you can see that from the topography of the map. All right, so it was originally traveling straight up here, and then eventually it'll just stop at Steeles. Um, but if you look at the grade between the two, there's not much of a difference, and that elevation isn't much at all. all right, it's probably 10 meters or so or whatnot. Yet you had to go from 100 kilometers per hour all the way to rest. And that was actually a huge issue here, because if you take a look at this uh, at the end, well, since you haven't changed much in elevation, you can easily be going right through this barreling at a very high speed, All right? And this crazy wall over here, funny enough, this wall never existed when I was your age in high school. And it's because of a horrendous story that happened here uh, back in the 90s. There was a truck where unfortunately he did lose his brakes and he just came barreling down here. Uh, unfortunately, it just drove all the way right through and hit the house back there, uh, killing a parent. Uh, on the ground floor. Uh, ever since then they've built up this wall to try to absorb as much energy as possible uh, for any truck that might accidentally barrel through. And that's why it's so important that whenever you have off ramps that there is some uh, elevation so that at least the vehicle can naturally slow down just in case if the brakes do fail. All right, number 12 is a, a multidisciplinary problem. This is one where you need to involve uh, all the units that we've covered so far. All right. First off, we know that it's starting from rest and it's going to accelerate. It's not going to accelerate as quickly as it can because when you draw the free body diagram, there is friction involved. The friction is at a coefficient of 0 0.20. So if you take a look at uh, your F net, your F net, at least in this inline dimension, is equal to Fg times the sine of theta, subtract the force of friction. And to solve for the force of friction, you need to compare the normal force with Fg times cosine of theta. All right, so the Fn y dimension will go to zero. And I'll tell you that Fn has to match up with the force of gravity, uh, at least in the perpendicular component of it. Force of friction is equal to mu k Fn. So if you sub that in, you get mu k mg cosine theta. Uh, if this question ever shows up in the future, make sure that you show all work. Please don't just jump to your conclusions with this. I want to see how that formula is derived. Okay, next we move on to the x dimension, which as we mentioned is equal to fg or mg sine theta. Subtract the force of friction, and they'll get you to this general expression right here. If you sub the values in and crunch through it, you get a number of, what is it, 2.36. And you can carry that number through, or if you really want to sub that equation into the next one, you're more than welcome to. After all, we're at a ramp where you start off at zero meters per second, and we will have a known VF. You have the distance, and you just solve for the acceleration. All right, and so yeah, after you've solved up to this point over here, you'll find out that your final speed is at 7.02 meters per second, and you'll just projectile right off here. You can solve this as a projectile problem, it will work out perfectly fine, all right? So you can find out the magnitude of your impact velocity given a projection angle of 25 degrees below the horizontal. You can try it out if you want to. You'll get the same answer, except it'll take you way longer to solve. So there is an easier way to solve it. At this point over here, since we have an isolated system, as we're not adding any new energy and we're not removing any energy, then this simply tells us that 1 half mvi squared plus mg delta hi is equal to 1 half mvf squared plus mg delta hf, where since we're at the ground level, mg delta hf goes to zero. All right, 
And after you sub everything in and crunch it through, you will arrive to uh, the correct answer of, I believe, uh, 11 meters per second. Three sig fig, okay, 10.9 meters per second. There's also another way of solving this entire problem here, and it has to do with the conservation of energy. All right, take a look at the work that's done over here. Yes, there's work in gravity and bringing it all the way down. There's also a little bit of friction work, which is negative, uh, uh, during the, just, just this part over here. Okay. So our total work is equal to the work due to gravity minus the work due to friction. All right, so our gravity does a certain amount of work bringing us all the way down of a distance of, what is it, 13.9 meters. So just make sure you sub in 13.9 uh, meters here. Uh, as for the work due to friction, it's over the distance of 10.4 meters and that's what we'll sub into there. Uh, as for everything else, it's the same givens as before. And again, work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And that's why on the left hand side, I just simply wrote down EKF minus EKI, where if you started from rest, that term goes to zero. And the interesting thing is that uh, no matter which approach that you use, the formulas are going to more or less be identical. Sure, I just need to rearrange a little bit, but they are effectively the same formula. Pretty neat, isn't it?